All right, it is 12.30, so it is go time. Um, thank you to all of you troopers that are staying up late and coming here to our panel. This is My Little Fandom, how we apply experiences of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, to other fandoms. Um, my name is Taylor Ramaj. I am a, um, a writer, a blogger, an author. Um, I'm interested in intersectionality, pop culture, theology, all sorts of things. Um, and with me is Brian Newby and Bill Ellis, and I'll let them briefly introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Bill Ellis. Uh, about all you need to know about me is that I got turned on to anime in 1999 by my teenage daughter. She was uh, highly amused that her favorite uh, show was Cowboy Bebop, and my favorite show was Cardcaptor Sakura. <laughs> and uh, I ended up uh, joining a, a fandom of uh, mostly uh, uh, teenage and uh, college-aged males that were likewise fascinated by shoujo anime. And so when someone alerted me to the brony phenomenon uh, much later on, uh, I got in, uh, visited some fan sites, and uh, somewhat to my surprise, I knew exactly what was going on. And so I've, uh, I'm fortunately retired from uh, the academic life, so I don't have to do this. I'm not in the publish or perish uh, mode anymore. Uh, I do it because I like it, and I hope you like what I do. Uh, I am uh, Brian Newby, and I am a professor of sociology at Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania. And you... Seriously? You've actually heard of that? Wow. Yeah. Hi. We're well. Considering it's about five feet across from one end to the other, we're neighbors now. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I, like I said, I'm a sociology professor. Uh, I study intersectionality and minority studies and pop culture and technology. And uh, today we are talking about fan bases, which falls under at least the pop culture category, right? And uh, my first topic is that fans are not sheep. Uh, this is a, apparently a giant surprise to academia, as we were discussing earlier in our, our hotel room, uh, this idea that, that we don't just fall blindly in line with somebody's loud talking, and we just go, that sounds great. I'm going to follow you everywhere. It's not that simple. People make up their minds. Uh, so. As a sociologist, I tend to go academic and I look up books. So uh, for me, the go-to book is The Practice of Everyday Life by Michel de Certeau, 1984. And de Certeau discusses how cultural texts can be politicized. Uh, the text is made, and it's a book, or it's a TV show, or it's a movie, whatever it is, YouTube videos these days, right? That's a text. And we are told, in the spirit of, of spreading education to the, the helpless and hopeless masses, that, uh, you know, our cultural texts, and we are told there can be only one interpretation, and that, that is it, that this is it, that whatever the author meant in this piece, that's all we get. And uh, uh, the problem is, is that this is just coming from the people on, uh, at the top of, of society, the power elite, we call them, and the power elite, uh, they tend to believe that products shape people and uh, that education is a hierarchical thing rather than a level playground. Um, so here we have uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall and of course our, our dear Starlight Glimmer uh, making everything a quote unquote level playing ground because she said so. Um, and what they do is they treat culture, what they're doing is they're treating culture as a commodity it's something that can be bought and sold, but never changed, but always repeated. Uh, this quote from a Chumbawamba album uh, speaks quite closely to this, this idea that you can't freeze culture, that you can take it, you can reuse it, you can do something new with it, um, but don't just try to repeat it over and over and over again, because all you end up with is processed crap, and everybody turns out like that. So, you know, this is perpetuated, unfortunately, by surplus media outlets. We have so many different media outlets that all they want to deal with, they don't want to deal with us, the fans, because there's a lot of us. 
they want to deal with just the producers and the creators. And unfortunately, they then believe the producers and the creators in their little isolation of, of producing and creating, they're the only creative ones. That we, the fans, have no creativity. We have no input into the things that we love. And, and that's just not true. Uh, and to the producers and the creators, who again are then isolated in this system, they only see themselves as being the productive ones, as being the creative ones. But we're creative too. And the cultural texts give us basic tools to work with. Uh, in 1973, Stuart Halls talks about how our imaginations can help us make what we want with these tools, these cultural tools. And he calls it encoding and decoding, this idea that creators and producers put one idea into their creation. But then when we, the fans, get a hold of it, we may not read into it the thing that they put in. We might come up with an entirely new interpretation. We have now decoded it to, to mean something different than what they encoded it in. And Longthaler takes this a step further by saying that this is actually a social process that we go through on a regular basis, starting with encoding. So the creators, they put messages into their texts. But we, when we get these texts, we don't just blindly read them or watch them and go, that was great. We talk about them, all right? Around the water cooler, as we used to say. You go and you talk about the latest episode of whatever. You talk about the latest book you just read, the latest t movie that just came out. And when we talk about them, this is where we begin to decode. We say you know, that these de discourses yield a collective agreement. We all start talking, well, I saw this in this episode. Well, I saw this in this episode. Well, I think it meant this, and I think I meant that. And we all come together, and we compromise. And when we do that, it creates an experience for us that's part of our everyday lives. This is something that we share with ourselves. This is something we share with each other. And it becomes a social thing. So these texts are no longer the, the products of producers, of creators. They belong to all of us to a certain extent because we've put something of ourselves into it. And we take what we understand from these texts and we make it part of ourselves. I can see some of you right now wearing it very clearly. You know, I am too. I've got my, I've got my cutie mark and my official insignia of the United Federation of Planets. We'll get back to that in a moment. All right. But this also means that there's going to be a lot of different interpretations. So many interpretations. There's a lot, especially these days with the internet. We can't just have a few people talking about a water cooler. Every water cooler on Earth is chatting about this on the internet, and we have eight billion different ways to talk about it. You know, now how do we get all this together? How do we make sense of all these different voices? We wear our fandoms on our sleeves, all right? And uh, Henry Jenkins, in 1992, writes a book called Textual Poachers, where he says that fans take the texts that they are given in the media, and they use them to create social groups and personal identities. So fans, uh, they, to a certain extent, they, they band together. They create fan fiction. They ship. They have deviant art. They have cosplays. They go to conventions, right? Even those of us who stay up all night to do so. Fans, in a way, they kind of slavishly study their texts in all its different pieces. We call this canon. Right? And we've all heard that phrase before. That's canon. That's not canon. It's the expanded universe. It's the alternate universe. It's Earth 17, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, this helps us participate in the discourse that Langthaler was talking about. Because now we get to say, well, in my fan group, we talk about it this way. And somebody else says, well, in my fan group, we talk about it this way. We study our texts, and then we interpret those texts in our own way. All right? We take the author's suggestions, but we don't slavishly stick to them. We do something different with them. And we share like we do here. This is a place of sharing. Everybody has their, I mean, just look at the costumes as we go through. How many different variations of Rainbow Dash do you see in this picture? How many, eight, how many different types of Pinkie Pies have you seen today? 
How many different Fluttershies? I saw at least one Flutter bat, right? She had a big wingspan too. It was pretty intimidating. If she'd flapped those things, I'd have just run away. You know, that's what we do though. And these become part of our personal values, all right? One of the big things in our community right now was the Big Mac event of, of season five, right? Where not only did he show up to the brother who's social, to the sister who's social as, as a brother in drag, but then he started having fantasies of being an olicorn, which up to this point is a purely female mode. And the fans went crazy. Absolutely crazy. There were those who were like, he's transgender. There were others who were like, no, this is insulting to transgenders. And there was others who were going to say, no, he's, he's transsexual. And others were like, no, that's insulting to transsexuals. It was this whole thing. And, and uh, everybody got involved, including the actor who had to actually put out like a little press release saying, just this is what it is. Please don't get pissed off. It's a show. You know, let's just go with it. And, um, you know, so, this was very exciting, though. We had all these different interpretations. Um, you know, which only adds more diversity to our discourse, all right, as well as experience of the text in everyday life. So we read into other people's ideas, and then we reread the texts based on those ideas, and we go, oh, I never noticed that before, which just makes our understanding of the text that much more intricate and more interesting, which makes it more important to us as individuals. And the more we get involved with it, the more it becomes a part of us, the more we bring it to our fan bases, the more we share, and it brings us all close together. That's what happens here at BronyCon. We've been coming here, this is our third year doing this, and uh, every year we, we sit back and we marvel at how so many different people just come together. I'm walking just a few minutes ago in our, our parking garage. Somebody sees that I'm wearing a pony t-shirt at the time, just starts talking to me. Like, we've been friends for years. He's just like, oh man, let me tell you about my day and just starts going on. I'm like, okay, let's just do this. Let's just be that group. Let's be that, those people. Because that's, that's friendship is magic, right? That's the lesson that we learn. It's in the title for Pete's sake, okay? Now, a little bit, you know, about how we all get here. We get here through different experiences because what we do is we take our fandoms and we take those groups and the lessons that we incorporate into our lives and we move them into different fan bases. We don't all just belong to one fan base. So we all came to this for different reasons. And, and uh, personally, for me, Star Trek was sort of my gateway drug into My Little Pony. You know, not only was the reason I started My Little Pony because I'm, my daughter's watching it one day and I go, oh my God, that is John Delancey. And I just went, oh, Q? You know, I got real excited. And then I started watching the show and I realized they shared a lot of the same things. So uh, for me, particularly Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine was, was about diversity. It was about inclusion. And most importantly, as best as possible, it was about peaceful resolution. It was about trying not to get in a fight and kill people. It wasn't, gosh, I see a bad guy. I should just kill them and move on. It was about trying to understand them, about trying to come to terms, trying to figure out a peaceful resolution for everyone. And that was something that really impacted me. So when I get to Friendship is Magic and I go, that's what they're doing here. They could have killed Nightmare Moon in the second episode. They didn't. They rehabilitated her. They, they brought her back and made her part of society again. What did they do with Starlight Glimmer? She ran them through the ringer. And still they went, hey, you want to come live at my place? That, that to me screamed Star Trek. That's like Picard going, all right, Q, you know what? It's just, you've been with me for seven seasons. You're a part of the crew already. You're fine, whatever, you know? And just, it was so neat, that kind of thing. So, hence why I have my, my Starfleet emblem on as well, my, my Federation, you know? And you put those together, and that becomes me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hijack your, uh, your mic for a moment here. Um, I've already pretty much said uh, what I what I have to say about uh, about me, and so what is this? Okay, oh, I gotcha. So uh, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go uh, cut straight to the ponies because uh, it's. I did a lot of work trying to theorize my part of the presentation, and finally it just got so intense that I said, "Oh, I'm gonna have to start watching uh, season six. 
And, well, you'll see. I had a reaction to that, and I'm using that to fit the theory that I put together uh, into this. So, what do I do? Okay. The first thing that I saw is that season six has a thing about labyrinths, about mazes. Uh, it's the first thing you see in the opening scene of the first episode, even before you get to the, uh, uh, the theme song. Starlight Glimmer saying, why does this place have to be so big? Where are the signs? Why does it, it's so hard to get rehabilitated, to move to the next level, and then things aren't clearer when you move up. Things get more complicated. And you go to the next episode past the double episode, and you've got another maze that is being described as part of the show, a Pinkie Pie and Rarity going through Manhattan. You go to another episode, and there's a different kind of a labyrinth, uh, Apple Bloom trying to figure out what she is supposed to be doing when she's not part of the Cutie Mark uh, Crusaders. And in episode after episode, you see this until you get to the last episode where you have this wonderful image of the Changeling's Hive, which is not just a maze, but one that is constantly changing. And only a Changeling can get through it. And even Thorax gets to a certain point and says, you know what? We're lost. And of course, layered over that, the figurative maze of telling the imposter ponies from the real ones. Why can't it be a lot simpler? Now, I have to stop and say, uh, I'm not a regular member of a, uh, of a brony fan group. Is this notorious that season six is the labyrinth season? That that's the, the key image of this? I don't want to be telling you guys what you already know. But when I got into this from my theoretical background, I said, okay, this is obviously something that this particular season is trying to tell bronies. And I followed this up, and I said, okay, what's a way through the maze? And I went back to the opening uh, adventure, The Crystalling, which uh, deals with two parallel stories. You've got Starlight, who's being sent back, with a one, two, three, follow these steps in order list of getting back into contact with, Starbur with Sunburst, who's her uh, childhood friend. And meanwhile, you've got the alicorn baby, which is something that has never happened before that is making something totally new in the Crystal Empire. And they go ahead in a parallel fashion. Sunburst is reluctant to talk. The reunion is a failure. Meanwhile, the royal baby is using her magic randomly to destroy things, including the precious crystal heart, which is essential to the, the welfare of the crystal empire. And nobody knows what to do. It is beyond even our understanding, says Luna. And Fluttershy says, mm, it's not very reassuring. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody can get out of the maze. Now, I have to apologize for my use of the term closeted. I'm using that in a neutral sense in the same way that cultural studies scholars now use the, the word queer or queered. Uh, Sunburst is, by his own choice, choosing to stay in his room and study his magic books over and over again. And when asked why, he simply says, you don't know what it was like at magic school to know so much and not be able to do any of it. And that was a statement that just stopped me cold when I watched it because I said, I've been there. I've known many people who were there. And it was interesting to read the, uh, uh, the MLP wiki 
and see that a lot of people just assumed that he was inept, that he knew a lot, but when it actually came to doing the tests, he, he flunked the tests. But I'm looking at him here, and he doesn't look like the sort of person who's embarrassed at having screwed up. He looks mad. He looks resentful. He looks bitter. He looks excluded precisely because he knew too much or he knew things that the establishment thought he shouldn't know too much about. Now let's follow the, the maze outside of, um, of uh, Ponyville and go into anime for a second because mazes are a dominant theme in anime too. This is Card Captor Sakura. And there are a lot of parallels between uh, anime and, uh, uh, and bronies. One of them is the term otaku, which is used by, uh, by anime fans in a, as an honor term but actually it's more likely to be used in a disrespectful term uh, in Japan. Just like fan, which is originally a disrespectful term being sh a, uh, a slang shortening of fanatic, an obsessive member of a cult, one of these people that are making much ado about nothing. It oftentimes assumes that, that uh, fans or otaku have no life. They live in their parents' house. They refuse to leave the fantasy world because they can't deal with the real world. They can't find work. They can't make social relationships. And North American fans of all different kinds likewise have been subjected to the same kind of stereotype. They engage in fantasy because they can't deal with reality. But actually, scholars have been looking at otaku and fan bases uh, for quite a long time. Um, as Brian pointed out, there's a lot of research that's been done on, among Trekkies. Uh, there's some new research that has to do with vampire romances, buffistas, for instance. Uh, there's some excellent research that's been done uh, lately about uh, participants in role-playing games. And when I got to this episode in season six, I said, ah, look, there's another maze. They're all over the place once you become sensitized to that theme in season six. And the bottom line is that fantasy is not escapism. It's a, it involves inventive ways in which fans use elements from canonical plots. They generate new stories. They generate a sense of a larger plot that is implied by the official version, but is oftentimes more daring, more transgressive, and allows them to deal with real life issues in a lucid, focused way. And so it's not retreat from fantasy. It's a new way of looking at reality. It's a new way to negotiate mazes that we all face in contemporary society. And I like this uh, quote by a, a former colleague of mine. Uh, I just attended a symposium in his honor in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, that he comments that uh, uh, this is a universal function of narrative. Uh, in which, in a very ponified way, we harness elements of the canonical plot to carry us into the contemporary world. And so Sunburst may well be uh, seen another way, the exemplar of the person that can, the contemporary world really needs. Now, Star Trek was one of the, uh, the themes that uh, was originally studied, and particularly uh, scholars noted on the odd way in which fans assumed that Kirk and Spock were engaged in a same-sex bromance. Uh, Brian watched uh, Star Trek uh, and assumed that uh, there was no such thing going on, that if anyone, uh, that uh, Kirk might have been involved with... Um, um, uh, Spock and McCoy. McCoy. It's always opposites that attract. But this was assumed by so many people so 
strongly that they considered it canonical, except that, of course, the 60s version could not have expressed that directly. Actually, sociologists suggest that this is an element that was poached precisely to deal with LGBT issues before they were uh, politically uh, correct and challenge the social construction of gender. And by doing that, they foreshadowed the, uh, the social acceptance of same-sex romances. And indeed, uh, we some of the later movies from the late 60s, early, uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s actually included uh, some elements that seemed to, to make this uh, romance or bromance uh, canonical. Now, otaku fan culture likewise dealt with same-sex issues, uh, except that these were canonical in the series. In Sailor Moon, there is a lesbian relationship between Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune. In Cardcaptor Sakura, there is a same-sex relationship within, between uh, Yukito and, uh, and Toya. Um, I'm an animation art collector, and I can tell you I paid a, a large sum of money for this cell, which is from the scene. No, it's not sexually explicit, but it's about explicit as you can get in anime. Uh, everyone knows what's going on in this scene. Uh, and the fact that these elements were censored out of the official U.S. releases was something that then made, created an intense fan culture that spread the word that the canonical text actually included these transgressive elements. And there was a lot of uh, work that was done on uh, writing even more transgressive fanfics. I know I wrote some of them myself. And I could say more about that, but I'm going to leave that to Taylor uh, in the next section. So bringing this back to the episode that I started with, you could say that that episode is suggesting that the inept geek is in fact the one that is needed in a new age where the alicorn baby has made everything new. And when Starlight confesses her many guilts against the equine uh, race, uh, Star Sunburst replies not, oh, how could you have done that? That was awful of you. And again, in another moment that just stopped me cold, he simply replies, did you really travel through time? He's an admirer. He's somebody that you wonder if the two of them had gotten back together before Starlight's reform and not after, if the fifth season wouldn't have ended quite differently. Because when he's summoned to the scene of the apocalypse that's taking place in the Crystal Empire, he immediately starts giving orders, God bless him, to Celestia Luna and Twilight. And together they restore the Crystal Heart. And you notice in this episode that he's very quietly managed to get uh, Starlight into that quartet on equal level with the, with the three princesses which perhaps is what she deserves. In a world where intellectual curiosity is considered strange and unprofitable, the otaku lifestyle has much to offer, said one of the early students of that culture in 2001. So going back to the maze, uh, again, a wonderful quote from uh, the late Bill Nicolaisen, one of my uh, mentors as a folklorist that I think sums this up in a nice way. Story is the inevitable and necessary result of social interaction, of the need to narrate oneself and each other in never-ending fictions. Without stories, we could not survive. Without stories, we would be disoriented. Without stories, we would be lost. Without stories, we lack assurance as to who we are or who we could be. Going back to this controlling theme, we're lost in the maze. We have no way out. But uh, we can turn our knowledge into stories that have never been told before, frameworks for our own action as we move ahead out of the maze and into even more complicated mazes. Thank you. All right. 
So um, Brian and Bill just gave us um, a lot of really great um, academic background. And I would just like to, um, to uh, just start to make this more concrete for us by talking more about how we can take stories with us as we move among our fandoms. Um, I find the ways that we uh, create and engage in fandom fascinating because when we watch a new show or read a new book series, um, we never do so in a vacuum, right? Uh, whether we realize it or not, we bring a lot of outside context to our reception and interpretation of a story. Some of that context is identity-based, our race, our gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and other intersectionalities influence our perception of characters, tropes, and plot twists. Um, some of that context is based on, uh, on religious, moral, and philosophical views. Um, some of it is based on experiences in our own personal lives. Um, and some of it is based on all of the stories that we loved before um, arriving at a new one. And the easiest way um, to start to capture this uh, cross-fandom phenomenon is by relating personal examples. Um, so this is the story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And um, I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there. Um, I'll tell you how I became a fan of these magical mares. And, and now you're all awake, hopefully, a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, on, on to my actual story. Um, one of the most important series of my childhood and adolescence was Sailor Moon. Um, compared to most of the other shows that I watched as a kid, uh, Sailor Moon gave me a story about female friendship and female empowerment um, that went beyond the token female character in an otherwise boy-centered story. I mean, a team of five girls who beat up monsters with magical powers and then read manga or went out for ice cream afterward was just awesome. Um, each member of the squad had uh, different personalities and interests, but, um, you know, sure, they fought sometimes, but at the end of the day, they were best friends, and they had each other's backs in a moment of crisis. Um, and all of these elements have just stuck with me over the years. I like the fantasy elements of Sailor Moon with all the powers and the aliens and all that. Um, so Sailor Moon was my gateway drug to every other anime. I like the high stakes of saving the universe. Um, and when, you know, when I see these elements in a new story, I'm more inclined to enjoy that new story because I'm automatically associating it with what I loved previously. And this is why I was so floored back in 2011 um, when my college roommate sat me down and showed me the pilot episodes of My Little Pony. At first I looked at it and I said, why would I watch this show? I never liked anything girly like this as a kid. Um, it just didn't really seem like anything I would enjoy at all. Um, but she queued it up and an hour later I was like, this is the greatest show I have seen since the last anime I watched. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I saw in season one's pilot episodes was um, everything that I remembered loving about Sailor Moon. Because we've got a young female character with magical powers. She acquires a squad of other characters who all become friends. They all band together to fight a villain who is actually possessed by a greater evil spirit. For Luna, it's Nightmare Moon, and for Queen Beryl in season one, it's Metallia. And each member of the squad represents a different thing. In My Little Pony, it's the planets, and in, uh, my, in, uh, excuse me, it's, in Sailor Moon, it's the planets. It's late. Um, and in My Little Pony, it's the elements of harmony. And of course, we can't forget the talking animal companions. Um, with Sailor Moon as such an influential context for me going into My Little Pony, these aspects of the pilot episodes jumped out at me and hooked me. So I automatically made all these connections and formed these expectations for what the show had in store based on this past fandom experience. Um, so that is just one instance of a, um, of a past show um, influencing my experience in My Little Pony. And now I'm gonna talk about um, how My Little Pony has influenced my experience of a show that I got into after the fact. Um, so Rarity is my favorite pony. Um, it's not because she's like me aesthetically or personality-wise or anything, but because she's unlike me. And she's the type of character I hated when I was a kid. Um, see, Rarity looks every part the air-headed, makeup-obsessed diva, as well as the femme fatale. And in most of the stories I consumed as a kid, this type of girl was always a villain. 
um, and she always embodied qualities that I wanted nothing to do with. I was smart and nice and loyal to my friends, um, and therefore makeup and fancy clothes just didn't represent me, um, and that was my leap in logic. Um, but something about Rarity just makes me get her nonetheless. And some of that is because the writers of My Little Pony made her more than a pretty girl who just uses her mascara to get what she wants. Um, Rarity at her core is not obsessed with fashion and appearances for the sake of impressing others or for uh, gloating about her status in society. She's obsessed with all of that for the art and self-expression of it. Um, and it's, it's not the same way that I do self-expression, but I appreciate it nonetheless. We all know she has her moments, but um, ultimately she loves being friends with ponies like Applejack and Rainbow Dash. And in so much of the other media that I consumed as a kid, girls like Rarity were never on good terms with girls like Applejack or Rainbow Dash. So for the most part, I kept disliking feminine characters in most media, but I think Rarity had started chipping away at me a little bit without me even noticing, because when I got to The Legend of Korra, I didn't vehemently hate or suspect Asami Sato like a lot of other people in the fandom seem to. I think there was and still is some Asami hatred because her appearance is a cultural shortcut for us, right? We look at her and we see femme fatale just as we see rarity. Um, but it turns out Asami isn't a femme fatale. In fact, other characters in the show screw her over pretty badly. And as far as I'm concerned, those hair flips are unintentionally seductive. But, um, but seriously though, um, Asami is actually a really loyal friend and an all-around sweet person, not to mention a successful businesswoman. She may look like this character type that's untrustworthy and deceptive, but her actual character defies that. And the point of all of this is, I realized that I might not have read Asami this way if I hadn't already liked Rarity and looked beyond the surface of her hyperfemininity. If Rarity could be a fabulous queen and not have a rotten personality, then so could other characters like Asami. Um. <laughs> so, uh, so shipping is one particularly strong way that many of us engage in fandom. Sometimes shipping allows us to, uh, to project ourselves onto characters with whom we strongly identify. Um, sometimes it allows us to vicariously experience feelings that we, uh, we cannot or do not experience in our own lives. And sometimes shipping gives us representation that is non-existent or non-explicit in canon. Um, and shipping is also a piece of fandom culture where we may notice some trends or similarities across multiple fandoms. These uh, fictional romantic relationships are narratives that contain tropes that we may connect with in many stories. Sometimes the crossover between shipping fandoms is so strong that fans will interpret one ship using another ship as a lens. Um, so, for example, many fans who ship Korra and Asami from Legend of Korra also ship Kara zor and Lena Luthor from Supergirl. Um, and why? Because many of us came to Supergirl after Legend of Korra. So we had Korasami all in our heads, and the second we saw a connection between a woman with amazingly strong godlike powers and a successful businesswoman without powers who works in technology and is trying to, to distance herself from her family's reputation, we were like, oh my god, it's Korasami all over again, I ship it. So those of us who like both pairings have Kora and Asami's story in our consciousness. And our minds automatically make connections when we watch Kara and Lena. In other words, a previous fandom experience influences how we perceive and analyze a relationship in a new story. And, you know, I can say the same from my experience with shipping in My Little Pony. I mean, I ship Applejack and Rarity for some of the same reasons that I ship Ruby and Wise from Ruby. I love the dynamic between a posh and or rich girl and a girl who's more down to earth or a total dork. And it's from these silly parallels that we find between shows, whether it's uh, shipping or character traits or plot points, that fans become inspired to create crossover works. Fan art and fan fiction are responses to uh, canon work where fans can apply one story to another if they choose. And with My Little Pony specifically, uh, because of the phenomenon of ponifying, 
There is tons of art and fan fiction that puts a My Little Pony spin on other franchises. And now a lot of people outside the fandom and maybe even in the fandom have issues with ponyfying everything, but the phenomenon is a particularly interesting and visible example of how mixing our fandoms in general is something that we just do. Making everything a pony is one way of filtering new and old fandoms through a My Little Pony lens, and we just get a kick out of combining our favorite things. So now that we've uh, talked about how we engage in fandoms and carry those experiences with us, we want to open it up to all of you um, to share your own stories of how uh, you mix your fandoms. And we have um, some questions up here, some prompt questions. And since we have such a small group, um, we can hopefully have a very lively and fruitful and energetic um, 110 a.m. discussion. So, um, Is it 110? Yes, it's 110. <laughs> so before you got into My Little Pony, what was your main fandom, and has that fandom influenced the way that you enjoy the show or participate in the fan culture? And then, you know, the flip side of that question, what have you gotten into since My Little Pony, and have you taken anything from what you learned in the show or what you've done in fandom to those new stories that you've fallen in love with? So. Have, have at it. You can raise your hand or, you know, let's get it started. Yeah, go right ahead. Oh, yeah? That's a good friend. That's yeah. A good friend. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Here we are indeed. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yeah, right right in the back. I actually found the uh, pony fandom through the furry book. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, I actually had a, when it came to uh, fan art, but I had a slightly higher expectation because I know how to do it for the fan art and things. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, that's a big one. I honestly can't think of any thing that I've gotten from my own pony. It's partially because I stopped watching it recently. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think the only thing that really influenced that MLP influence of the fandoms is how I start seeing connections mm -hmm. because comics and uh, stories. Cool. Great, thank you for sharing.
Well, maybe that's something that I'm seeing because uh, you know, it, I, do, I do see it as applying to myself. And I do think that the that the it, it would be accurate to say that 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 the theme of that uh, season is what do you do when you move to the next level? Uh, because that's the the dilemma of uh, of Starlight uh, Glimmer, who's been reformed and who has now been uh, gone to. Uh, to be apprenticed to learn all about friendship from uh, Twilight uh, Sparkle, and uh, and even with a uh, an experienced mentor who's been through the the process, she still finds it a disorienting experience, and in the end, one that she has to bring to a term without Twilight's help. And at the same time, you have the, the dilemma of the, uh, the cutie mark crusaders, who now they've got their cutie marks, now they've got their, uh, their mission. What do they do next? And that seems to be a constant uh, issue in, uh, in season six. What do we do now? We've won this victory. We've, uh, we've moved up. We've, uh, we've settled the last crisis. What do we do now? How do we... How do we, uh, in, in the using some of the themes from the last one, how do we uh, go through our metamorphosis and come out the other side? And there is no clear answer, because uh, at least the way I'm reading the first episode, uh, the alicorn baby has been born. The alicorn baby is being born all the time. Uh, things are happening that we have no way of predicting, uh, and the present is something that we don't come with a preconceived path through. And so I think we're all in the maze uh, in one way or another. Some of that I'm getting fr through anime because uh, one of my early uh, uh, series that I, uh, that I came to love was, uh, was Oh My Goddess. And... Uh, the, the key figure in that is Belle Dandy, who is also, among other things, the goddess of the present moment. And at least in the first episodes, um, Keiichi cannot go more than a certain number of feet from that goddess, that they are, uh, that they're forced by the terms of their agreement to stay together. And that, of course, makes perfect sense because the present moment is uh, is the one uh, God-given thing that you cannot get away from, that you are intimately connected to this present moment. You can try to live in the past, you can try to predict the future, but the present is what you have to deal with. You were gonna, were you gonna add something? Yeah. I say this all the time to to uh, when when I've uh, taught in the classroom and and I still teach online. Uh, I could be wrong, and my wife uh, is going to quietly say from the other room, and often is. Uh, but I, I think I'm I think I'm right on at least one level that this is one of the things that uh, that really intrigues me about the series that there are no preconceived answers. Uh, there are uh, there are truths that uh, the the ponies have to rely on through thick and thin, uh, but th there is not a ready-made answer about how to make a friend or how to deal with an awkward situation in a friendship. 
you just have to trust to what you you feel is uh, is good. And and on that note, um, I'm just curious if if any of you have um, can can think of um, other like shows, movies, comics, like whatever, anything else that you're into that um, that you know does the same thing narratively that um, that Bill just described. Um, Steven Universe. In, in what ways um, can you think of? Like there, like, like, uh, like you said, there's not really good answers. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't know if you want to. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Just a listening conversation. <laughs> like, like, you guys are never quite sure what to do next. Like, what, what, what the answers to the situation? Mm -hmm. You know, this monster is being the bloody bitch that all the world is. Mm -hmm. So what's going on? You're never quite sure what the answer is. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just not a monster. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're fighting this guy. Okay, we're fighting this guy. Mm -hmm. And then when you, you know, they bought this wrong this guy, you know, they kind of price people like his entire life is just trying to get stronger. And what you see here is he actually is still strong as God. He's kind of mm -hmm. running out of time. Mm -hmm. And he is the new monster. Mm -hmm. And he's just trying to get rid of it. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank we you. appreciate it. We, have, have, we to... have some social medias, oh. if you're ever so inclined. <laughs> and I have Fine. to say how much I appreciate that there are people Absolutely. who are willing to come out at yeah. 1230 at night yes. for a panel like this. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I, I'm not just praising you, although I certainly am praising you, but I think it's, uh, you know, to have a community where even one out of a hundred would consider to doing such a thing is uh, is a remarkable gift. Yeah, y'all are rock stars. I mean, seriously, we, we've been we've been sitting in our hotel room like our panels in four hours and three hours. Oh my gosh, um, it is it is late. Um, you guys have had a long day. We've all had a long day. Um, so again, like I can't thank you all enough for um, for sitting down with us at this late hour and you guys in the back too for waving oh, your hands yeah. and keeping the lights on yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you very much go get some sleep yeah go to sleep go to bed